Hello, welcome everyone. We're giving this a few moments to let people go ahead and join us, sign in from wherever you are. We'll begin in just a couple of minutes and we know people are joining uh, through the Zoom registration and we can see those participants coming on. So we're just going to wait a few moments for that. And um, also know that people will be watching us on YouTube and perhaps through Facebook. So uh, the wonders of, of technology, meeting ancient wisdom <laughs> happening right now. And so in just a few moments, I will begin the program, but please everyone take their time, settle in. It'll be a wonderful uh, little bit over an hour um, that we'll share together. We're really looking forward to this. And grateful we have all of our uh, panelists here already. So in just a moment, we will we will begin the program. All right. Hello, my name is Karenna Gore, and I direct the Center for Earth Ethics at Union Theological Seminary in New York City. It is my pleasure to welcome you all to today's conversation, Post-Colonial Poetics, Aliyun Young on the Human Nature relationship. We had hoped to gather in person to lift up and celebrate and learn from uh, Professor Nyang's book, but we are also delighted to do it this way, which allows us to share more widely across space and time. Thank you to the Institute for African Studies at Columbia University for co-sponsoring this wonderful gathering, and thank you all for being here. Aliyu Sise Nyang earned his BA at Williams Baptist College in Arkansas, his master's in theology at Logston School of Theology in Texas, and his doctorate in biblical interpretation in the New Testament with distinction at Bright Divinity School, which is also in Texas. While still a graduate student at Bright, he served as a lecturer in New Testament survey classes and co-taught a post-colonial biblical interpretation course he then taught at Texas Christian University and at Memphis Theological Seminary, where he was named the Reverend Dr. James L. Netter's Associate Professor of New Testament and received the Paul R. Brown Distinguished Teaching Award. He joined Union in 2011. Professor Young's teaching and research explore themes and issues in biblical and post-colonial theologies. We're deeply honored to have him with us today to discuss his most recent book, a Poetics of Post-Colonial Biblical Criticism, God, Human Nature Relationship, and Negritude. On a personal note, I am grateful that Professor Young was my New Testament professor when I was a student at Union and very much influenced my own interest in and views on these topics, having quite a lot to do with how we set up the Center for Earth Ethics to begin with. In the preface, Professor Nyang describes this work as, quote, a humble reading of scripture in conversation with Jola faith traditions. It is certainly that, but if I may say so, it is also much more. Professor Nyang also presents the work of Leopold Sedar Senghor and other post-colonial theorists to fully elucidate and contextualize the effect of colonization on the traditional practices of the Jola, especially their sacred relationship to growing rice. And it reveals the theological dimensions of our global ecological crisis in fresh and important ways. With indigenous peoples stewarding 80% of the world's remaining biodiversity today, many more people are hearing the call to honor, protect, and learn from these traditional practices. 
And let us keep in mind that as we meet today, world leaders are gathered in Glasgow, Scotland, under the auspices of the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change, to finally truly face the urgency of this challenge. The perilous trajectory that the human nature relationship as it currently is iterated has taken us on now. As many faith leaders have said in different ways, it is not nature that needs fixing, but rather it is the human relationship to nature. And this is about more than science, data, and technology, as important as they are. It is about beliefs, values, and culture. And voices from Africa carry essential wisdom for many reasons, not least because people there are among those who have done the least to cause this crisis, but are the most impacted by it and have rich cultural traditions and histories to share with the world as we grapple with this challenge. For all these reasons and more, this work is vital. To help us appreciate and discuss uh, uh, Professor Nyang's work, we are honored to have two other voices. Suleiman Bashir Jian is a professor of French and philosophy at Columbia University, where he directs the Institute for African Studies. We're delighted, as I mentioned earlier, that the Institute is co-sponsoring today's event. A distinguished philosopher and literary scholar, Professor Jiang's work has covered the history of logic and mathematics, epistemology, philosophy in the Islamic world and modern France, identity formation, and African philosophies. He taught philosophy for many years at Sheikh Anta Diop University in Senegal and at Northwestern University before coming to Columbia in 2008. Among his many honors, Professor Jiang has been elected to the American Academy of Arts and Sciences and the Royal Academy of Belgium, and his work has received two prizes from France's Academy of Moral and Political Sciences. And finally, our colleague Petra Tomes. After more than 20 years working as a teacher and with New York City's Department of Education, Petra Tomes came to Union Theological Seminary, where she majored in church history, worked with us at the Center for Earth Ethics, and earned her Master's of Divinity. An advocate for the rights of indigenous peoples and lifting up their knowledge for all to learn from, Reverend Tomes has focused on the doctrine of discovery and how it has fostered racism and extreme marginalization for indigenous communities globally. She is now executive director of the Ramapo Lenape Community Center in Mawa, New Jersey, operated by the Ramapo Mountain Indians. And she recently became the minister of the Unitarian Universalist Congregation of Central Nassau in Garden City, New York. Thank you both for joining us today. A note about today's conversation before we begin. We will begin with Professor Nyang's presentation, then Professor Jiang will speak, and then Reverend Tomes. If you have questions, please put them into the chat and we will try to address them following our three speakers. Many thanks and thank you. And please proceed, Professor Nyang. Thank you so much, uh, Corinne Gore and uh, your gracious words are crucial, and I receive them humbly. When it comes to the book that we're talking about, and what I thought about since the first time I presented in here at Union, I was invited by um, Corinna Gore to speak for about probably, I think it was 15 minutes when the Pope was coming to America. And so I started, it was a very uh, simple presentation that turned into a book because Elizabeth, when she saw uh, Elizabeth, my wife, she looked at the presentation and she said to me, you're working on a project, but I want you to change it and write on this topic because this is, it seems to me you love this topic, so why don't you write your book on this? And that's how this book came into existence. So God, human nature, relationship, and negligence. Notice I reverse the title. I used now the subtitle and then the main title, which is the poetics of postcolonial biblical criticism, I put it down, and that's the reason for that. And the reason for that is because Senegal 
is a country, it's a very small country. And as you can see from the African map, you see that uh, the country is almost a dot when you look at uh, the entire world. And uh, the Jolo people are right here. This is where the Jolo people live, but that doesn't mean they're not spread all over the country, but this is where they settled. And so I thought to provide this map so you can have a sense of where the Jola people live. And still to this day, this will be the Jola location. And some will call it Jola country and because the Jolas tend to think this is a sort of country. Uh, and that's a, a reason for that. So this is now showing this section that you see here is the setting that I want to talk about. The Jolo people live also in this area, but I'm focused on this specific area where my grandparents come from. This is Feleki. My grandmother is from Feleki. And the, my grandfather is from Enampur. So they, this is a very uh, interesting area where most anthropologists will call this area the Brain-Seleki, the Brain-Seleki, the Jola of Brain-Seleki. Others will use the word Banjal. So my relationship to this area is through my grandparents. My father is a northerner. He's from Richatol with the Walo Walo people, but that's another project. So let me just focus on this one. And uh, the book starts in a very interesting way. And most people who will look at it will wonder, why did he start it this way? So Leopold Sedar Senghor said something in, in 1956, when many leaders who are of African descent from America, the islands, meaning the Caribbean islands and continental Africa met in France. They met in Sorbonne to speak about what it means to have a culture that actually contributed to world civilization, which colonization suppressed. So in his speech, which is a powerful speech and uh, the spirit of civilization on page 52, he says this, the Negro is the person of nature who traditionally lives of and with the soil in and by the cosmos. I was struck by that statement. So I read the entire uh, article or the entire speech. And then I read another speech that gave me a sense of understanding how Sangor valued human relationship with nature. Of course, he's from the fairer group of people and they are agrarian people, but there are some of them who do fish. So are the Jola, agrarian people, but also they do live with uh, uh, using, for instance, fishing and trapping. Uh, they do all that. Now, what's interesting is as I was researching, I came across the work of Paolo Palmare, who lived with the Jola to write a book. And what's interesting in this book is he lived among the Jola of Moff Avi, who are my ancestors and my grandparents and my grandmother, my grandmother and my grandfather, they come from this group of people. And here is what he says. Most important perhaps is the relationship between people and nature and how people view nature and relate to it is so as to ensure their survival. The Jola feel that they are part of a totality in which they, the objects around them, the things that happen, and the nature itself are elements within a single and all-encompassing context. 
This is why the element needed for survival, like the land and its products, the forests and animals, are not considered to be available to anyone who happened to be the first to take possession of them. Nature is not seen as an object to be exploited, but rather a subject that meets people on equal terms. That's powerful for me. As a Jola, I see a foreign anthropolo anthropologist understanding what a Jola does and how a Jola lives in relationship to nature. But I want to add another statement because since the title is a post-colonial biblical criticism, a poetic of post-colonial biblical criticism, I thought this quotation from Sangor is crucial. And this quotation, I tried to find it myself, but I was unable to find it. I relied on the work of Sylvia Bach, the, con uh, the concept of negritude, <clears throat> and she captured it. And another scholar who lived with, in Africa and studied African literature and uh, does also have this quotation, but let me read it. Tangor said this, in what circumstances did MSSR and I launch the word negritude in the year 1933 through 35? Together with a few other black students, we were at the time in panic speaker. The horizon was blocked, no reform in sight, and the colonizers were legitimizing our political and economic dependence by the theory of tabula rasa. They deemed we had invented nothing, created nothing, written, sculptured, painted, and sung nothing. To establish an effective revolution, our revolution, we first had to get rid of our borrowed attire, that of assimilation, and assert our being, namely our negritude. Nevertheless, negritude, even when defined as the total of Black Africa's cultural values, could only offer us the beginning of a solution to our problem. Not the solution itself. We could not go back to our former condition to a negritude of the sources. To be really ourselves, we had to embody Negro African culture in 21st century realities to enable our negritude to be, instead of a museum piece, the effective instrument of liberation. It was necessary to cleanse it of its drafts and include it in the united movement of the contemporary world. I thought this captures Stengel's understanding of the situation of the time, that African, people of African descent needed to reposition themselves and debunk the theory of the tabula rasa and bring forward to the world and present to the world the African cultural values. So in this case, Sangor then, even though most people don't read him as a post-colonial critic, I argue that just this statement places, uh, places him, this statement places Sangor at the very heart of what I call post-colonial biblical criticism. And the reason for that is this is a Catholic. He believed he's a Christian who read scripture, even though we don't, uh, most critics didn't re realize that. His own understanding is embedded in his faith, not only his Catholic faith, but also his sacred faith traditions. This takes us then to the Jonah people. 
In the book, I did discuss Jola agriculture. So the Jola relationship with nature is crucial. It is an eco-sensitive way of farming based upon rituals. And the rituals are crucial for the Jola to relate to nature because the Jola talks to nature and nature talks back. And with rituals, Jola understands specifically the elders to ensure those rituals continue to, to provide the Jola a sense of not only relating to nature, but also how to cultivate, how to form. So under the aegis of Allah Emit, Allah Emit is the supreme deity uh, that the Jola believes. The, the Jola supreme deity is at the very heart of their own existence. And the Jola gives them gifts such as rice, but also the Jola believe that God provides rain for the Jola to farm. Now, the agricultural tool is this one. Notice this tool. This person, Jola person, who is cultivating is using this very nature-friendly tool. And this tool, according to anthropologists who studied the Jola people, they find it to be a very nature-friendly but ingenious invention for, for, for cultivating. Notice here you have the dikes, you have irrigation, you have here already harvested land, but this harvested uh, field, this is not to be burned. And notice this farmer is cultivating and overturning the harvested rice and this will provide fertilization for the next season. But that's not the only source of fertilization. They do uh, fertilize using something like the way we do it here in cities is compost. But the Jola does it differently, digging a hole around the house to provide uh, some kind of fertilization that is doesn't have chemicals the way colonization will introduce later on. This is another way the Jola negotiates with life and the nature. And the life of the Jola is linked to looking at how some of the trees like the Acacia albida, which dispenses nitrogen. So it's very good to farm around it and have the paddy rice here that will transplant it. And here you have a symbiosis between the rice planted and what this tree dispenses. And you find it's almost, it's understanding how nature, how the ecosystem creates fertilization of its own self. And you see the fence, the rice, and these branches are crucial. The fruit also from the acacia albida is crucial. And the Jola discovered that. And it's not only the Jola, there's also peasants in Northern Senegal who know how to negotiate agriculture around the acacia albida. So the symbolic world of the Bible. So having done that, I decided to look at the biblical text as a biblical uh, student, I thought maybe there's something in scripture that Christians miss, that there's a voice in scripture that is a very much concerned about how human, humans relate to nature. What I discovered, uh, discovered was stunning. Reading Genesis, God spoke and nature responded to divine speech. That's crucial for me because he echoes what my Jola ancestors understood about how to relate to nature. What is it? God in Leviticus warned Israel, <clears throat> saying to Israel that they are to act as tenants and that the law, the land belongs to God. The land didn't belong to Israel, according to Leviticus 25:23. He says, the land is mine, you are tenants. <clears throat> Which means 
that Israel is warned not to sell the land in perpetuity. And this is found also in the same passage. So which informed me in my biblical reading that uh, there's a disconnection between nature and spirituality in ancient Israel, a spirituality not to be ignored because if the land is mistreated or sold in perpetuity, that's jettisoning what the biblical jubilee calls for. In, es in essence, the biblical text in ancient Israel, Israel is to learn that if they relate to nature and obey to the obey the commandments of the deity, which is the God of Israel, then they will have enough to go around. They will have enough to take care of those who don't who, who are in need, but also the concept of solidarity, teaming up in an agrarian context is crucial. And I hear the echo of that in Jola solidarity, Jola agriculture, and Jola relationship to their deity. In the New Testament, I found some of the parables that are selected in the book are very crucial. For instance, Luke 13, it's interesting where the landowner in the Roman, on the Roman Palestine, uh, this landowner is pictured as someone who probably doesn't understand much agricultural connection with humans. So he did come up and see this fig tree and the fig tree wasn't producing. So he asked this gardener to cut it, cut it down and uh, the gardener defended the fig tree by saying, well, let me put manure, I have to say, let me communicate with arable land. And then when it does, if it doesn't produce, then we'll cut it down. So that, that parable showed to me, as I read it, not only human agency, but the agency of the land and the agency of the fig tree. So all that, calls for a symbiotic relationship, where, which Sangor will actually talk about in some of his writings. So nature agency is crucial, human agency is crucial, um, and also the understanding of that agency reminds us that again, God cares about nature, and God cares on, about how humans negotiate life with nature. So one key text in Genesis, which is Genesis 2.15, is striking to me, where God actually was a gardener. God planted a garden, placed in the garden Adam, I will say humanity, and say humanity then to cultivate the land and to watch over it, but some translations have to keep. But the Hebrew translation allows for reading it as caring for. Instead of keeping, is to cultivate and to watch for. So for me, watching for means taking care, meaning uh, playing the role of a person who understands the language of nature and then relates to nature on equal terms. Now, when empire is brought into the discussion, and specifically when I look at the Roman Empire, since I cannot deal with the biblical text without looking at imperial influence on the Palestinians, specifically, the Jews in the first century. So land tenure laws. The land tenure laws, if I understand Genesis and understand Leviticus, then if Israel is to be a tenant and God is the one who owns the land, so the land should be distributed in ancient Israel by usufruct. So 
if empire comes and impose imperial ways of looking at land, then there are new tenure laws that empire brings in that displaces what the traditional user um, land allocation is completely undermined. That happened because the Herodians, the land that belongs to God now belongs to Rome through the ministry of Herod and his children. So you begin to see how the peasant in ancient, uh, in the Palestinian context during uh, the ministry of Jesus, the peasants were, were displaced. Some of the land confiscated by Herod Antipas and Archelaus. So you begin to see now the land not belonging to God, but it belongs to humans, to imperial officials, to puppet kings. And then those Israelites who learn to understand that they are tenants and that the land belongs to God, that kind of understanding the relationship between human and nature is completely undermined. Now, when the French were colonizing West Africa, it's not just West Africa, but we can talk about Algeria. This captain, Captain Froelich, wrote a book and he outlined why colonization, why the French are colonizing and the purpose of colonization. And then he has three phases, three processes that began with the actual conquest, pacification and exploitation. Three kind of colony, colonies are to be created. Colonies of settlement, such as Algeria, but it turned out to be a mess. And then colonies of exploitation, Senegal will be one of them. And then a combination of two, which means a colony that is both settlement and exploitation. And Madagascar perhaps is on that area. Now, I've said this to show you how colonization help displaced. If this is the case, then what we will have in Senegal will be exploitation. The Romans and nature. So Romans did also do, do something crucial in Rome when the Roman Empire was colonizing, as I said, is captured through images. And let me show you why I'm saying this. The Augustan cuirass captures Zeus here. And notice here in, at the bottom, meaning the stomach or the belly of Augustus Caesar, you have a cornucopia here. So which means this in essence captures how Rome looked at Roman colonization. So the Roman empire is a sort of a heavenized space to show the deity here, Zeus, or we can call Jupiter when it comes to the Romans. And then you have the idea of abundance. So this is a miniaturized way of looking at how Rome captures the Roman Empire and Augustus being the son of God. And Augustus is the one who brings the good news and the good news is actually bad news for those would be colonized because the cornucopia means taking from the colonies to feed empire. So the British did the same. They had a painting that actually almost echoes what the Romans have on the breastplate or the, the cuirass of Augustus Caesar. And, and so let me go to it. Here is the painting. Notice the cornucopia here. You have one cornucopia here. Very interesting. And look at now how the British Empire looked at the world. The world is captured in this image. The map shows the extent of the British Empire in 1886. So, and uh, just to give you an idea, and then did the French have anything that looks like this? Of course, we go to that painting, which is interesting. 
La France et les cinq continents, French and Five Continents, by Pierre Henri Ducos de la Haye, 1889 through 1972. Now, let me say something about this. It's interesting. 1889 is actually several years. The Berlin Conference was in 1884-85, and the Berlin Conference. Uh, is the one that actually legitimized the scramble of Africa, where the European decided who gets what in Africa. The maps were drawn now, solidified, even though contested by some of the imperial forces. So notice in the middle, this is symbolic of France. These are the peace, the doves, and notice on the side, the Africans, almost naked. And look at uh, Oceania, look at here, uh, the East, Middle East, meaning India. And so it's quite interesting. It captures not only these, the, the, the French, basically capturing the extent of the French empire, but you don't see a cornucopia here. The cornucopia, for me, in the book, as I interpreted, is these people who are colonized bringing what agricultural produce they have to empire. And empire, in return, gives them peace with these doves. And she is the symbol of the presence of the French empire. And interestingly, uh, this, uh, this artist in this fresco has here, this is America, uh, quite interesting. I still have to deal with this picture later on for another project. Senegalian France, notice the effort was accomplished in Algeria, Senegal, Sudan, Tokyo, Madagascar, Congo, and Tunisia. What we, what we must consider is the civilized mission of France. The greatness of France, when it comes to colonization, is her powerful intellectual influence that no obstacle could stop, that penetrates the darkness of the most remote and savage regions of the surface of the globe. It is colonization in the true sense of the word, colere or educate. That is the cultivation of mind as well as, and the last one is the one that I'm focusing on. Yes, is intellectual education. Yes, is building schools. Yes, is training Africans in speaking French, in studying, what the French culture had to offer. But also this is one that I think is a very shrewd, productive as productive land. Productive land for me, that's where the exploitation of agricultural resources is. Peanuts became the cash crop, which is quite interesting. In 1841 through 1853, increased from two to 166 tons to 3,000 tons. Peanut became a savior of Senegal, according to the colonists. So the new economy, the World Bank and IMF, all the way to 1944, the Bretton Woods Conference actually was very much involved because now the French Empire will impose the price of peanuts, since the peanuts now is the new cash crop. And these peanuts then became very crucial, specifically from northern Jola territory uh, in and around the Gambia, the peanut farming began there. So when the Jolo people began now to join this cash crop, it created a problem. Earlier before colonization, the Jolo women and the men 
specifically farm the rice together. There's no power differential at that time. Uh, as far as I can tell, looking at the sources, but also experiencing my grandparents and how they related in farming. And they told me stories about that. So what happened was some journal who joined the peanut farming happened now to join the new economy where the currency, the money, the, the new currency becomes the French that linked the French money, the CFR became a problem for some of the journal because now the men will join farming peanuts instead of farming rice. The women are now left to farm rice and feed their families, which is quite interesting here. The problem is that the men get to keep the money and the women become dependent. And if they need the money, they will ask the husbands. That power differential kind of uh, destabilized the egalitarian notion in Jola country, specifically Jola, the Jola of Moff Abbey. Now, there was a decline in rice farming by men. And so some of the men in 1944, uh, 45, uh, no, actually I will go back in 1930s, 39, uh, the men were now being captured and recruited to become what they call the Tirailleurs Senegalais. And they joined in the French army. And so one thing that can help us capture that is this clip by Usman Sandal. The clip is called Emitai, which is quite interesting, using the Jola name for the deity, which is Emitai. And I want to play it, it's very short, and then I'll continue and I'll end my discussion of the book in a minute. So here is... So, as you see, that captures the reality because rice was needed by the French and also the French needed uh, taxes to support their war against the Germans. So, which is quite interesting. And so the Jola resisted. Not all Jolas went along with it, some resisted. So, Sangorian Negritude, he wrote, but notice this quotation that I have here, he says, but perhaps more than the climate, rather than the cosmic forces, more than the sun and moon acted the plant and animals, environments, from the importance of trees and animals in Black African mythology, in the development of totems and themes, the Black African were given very early agriculture, and it is the agricultural sector that better explain their society. 
I'll repeat, the African Negro is a farmer who lives of and with the land. Agronomists realized after having introduced two hasty European farming methods. They, their science had failed at first, where practices of Black Africans have succeeded without isms or logic or plow. But these were familiar with nature, their farm in all direction. We shall, we shall see the tree and the animal. I think this quotation helps also capture how Sangor understood how the African relates to nature. And this is missed in most critics of Sangor. They look at this as basically uh, an essentialization of his culture. No, he was responding to imperialism. He was responding to empire that objectified people who knew what they were doing as they were relating to nature. Senegal economy remained dependent on the structures that have been set since the colonization. Economy and agricultural policies applied since independent have not improved the living condition of rural and urban population. Many of which remain nostalgic for the colonial period in which living conditions appear their best. The fundamental structure of Senegalese agriculture is subjected to a tyranny of peanuts. Internally, this tyranny has stifled the development of subsistence farming of which the external opportunities are still dependent on the world context which provides its input and its main step. Conclusion, oh God, you must have pity on us, your children. We wish that the Europeans will not return anymore. Why do the Europeans want to, nothing, want to do nothing but squander our land? But we wish all the more that God will hold their spirit in God's hand so that they will not have the idea of returning to Africa. This is prophet Alin Sutoye Jata, who was a prophet who resisted imperialism. He re she resisted how the French was treating the Jola. She resisted the way in which the agriculture of peanuts displaced farming rice with the Jola things. Farming rice is a divine gift rice is a given gift, and the farming has to practice rituals which agriculture, uh, specifically farming peanuts, displaced during her time. For that, she suffered. She was exiled to, um, to Timbuktu, where she was never heard from again. But some argue that she died of um, basically fasting to resist the French colonization. Now, I'll go back to Leviticus as I close. The land shall not be sold in perpetuity for the land is mine. With me, you are but aliens and tenants. Throughout the land, you shall hold. Throughout the land, you hold, that you hold, you shall provide for the redemption of the land. So which means here, this doesn't belong. Israel should understand themselves as farmers to relate to nature and listen to their deity. The Jola did the same by listening to deity, to the deity and then listening to the nature and farming. They were displaced by colonization just like the Palestinian Jews at the time of Imperial Rome, occupation of Palestine, displaced also their agricultural practices and their relationship to the land. The land that you are crossing over to inherit is the land of hills and valleys. 
watered by rain from the sky and the land that the Lord your God looks after. The eyes of the Lord your God are always on it from the beginning to the year that from the beginning of the year to the end of the year. You will only heed, if you only heed his every commandment that I am commanding to you, loving the Lord your God and serving him with all your heart and with all your soul, then he will give you rain for your land in its season. The early rain and the late rain, and you will gather in your grain, your wine and your oil, and he will give grass in your field for your livestock, and you will eat your field. So this is God reminding Israel how they should relate to the land and how God will provide rain for them. The Jola believed in the same understanding that when you relate to nature and obey the deity's command, the deity a command to do proper rituals to relate to the land, God will provide rain. In fact, Alin Sutoi practiced rain making, rain making at the times of droughts. And she was known to have practiced that and people witnessed that her rain making uh, practices did provide rain for the Jola people. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Nyang. That um, was fascinating. And Professor Jiang, please. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure really to be, uh, to participate in this conversation around uh, uh, Aliu Nyang's uh, magnificent book. I understand that if we have to keep this uh, close to an hour, I have just a few minutes now. Uh, so let, let, let me let me clarify that that we will uh, allow you uh, fifteen minutes or or ten, however you want. Okay, I'll keep to try to keep it very very short, as short as I can. I'll just uh, start with uh, uh, where uh, with a comparison between the the Jola cosmology that has been so wonderfully presented by Aliu uh, uh, Nya and uh, what Senghor. Uh, calls the kingdom of childhood. Uh, uh, Senghor is, uh, to answer a question uh, earlier raised by Aliu about uh, uh, Senghor's relationship to nature, that relationship uh, he describes uh, as what he calls his uh, kingdom of childhood. Uh, Senghor uh, is a Serer, and the Serer cosmology and the Jola cosmology are very similar. I uh, believe that Aliu Nyang will agree with that. And I will say many West African cosmologies in general. We do know that Africa is not one country. Usually uh, it is uh, now people are more careful about talking about Africa in general and generalizing anything they have to say about any single uh, uh, um, region of, of Africa. But in this particular case, yes, indeed, there is a common denominator uh, uh, between different African, West African cosmologies, which is understandable. And uh, uh, the cosmology described by Senghor and that the Aliu Nyan speaks about uh, also in his book is uh, very important to, 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 to understand. And I want to connect what Senghor says about uh, uh, um, Serer cosmology with a quote, a wonderful quote that I uh, uh, take from uh, Aliu Nyang's book. Uh, Dr. Nyang writes that Jola people have always tried to maintain a symbiotic life with nature for sustenance and healthcare. And I want to connect this with what uh, uh, the way in which Senghor describes uh, African traditional cosmologies or West African traditional cosmologies uh, by uh, um, summarizing the reality of these cosmologies through a certain number of propositions. 
Proposition one, existence, every existing being is a force. To be is to be a force of life. That is axiom number one. This is not to say that force is predicated to a substance that would be being. It is not to say that the existence has force. It is to say that the existence is force. They are identified. Uh, uh, being, in other words, force. Second axiom, what is good is defined as what reinforces the force, reinforces the being force. In other words, the goal of a force is to seek being more of a force. And what is good is defined as what precisely uh, goes in that direction and reinforces the force. Senghor has coined in French a word, it is a neologism, to just have the symmetry with reinforcing. He coined in French, in French, de force, uh, to unforce, if one wanted to, to, to translate it literally into English, and says that what deforces a force, what like a vampire sucks out the vital substance that it is, is bad. So the good and the bad, the good and the evil are defined as what reinforces or deforces the force. And this is very important. The idea that all force naturally strive to be more force or in different terms, if you want to use the language of being, the goal of a being is to become more being. And this more being is important in Senghor's thought as Alunyan knows well. First of all, this expression, plus être in French, more being, is an expression coming from Father Théard de Chardin, this Catholic priest who was, whose philosophy was so important for Senghor. There were probably two, the two main philosophers, or the three main philosophers important for Senghor thought were Bergson, uh, Henri Bergson, uh, Théard de Chardin, and Karl Marx, because of his own vision of uh, 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 African socialism. But the important aspect here is that the cosmology that Senghor has in mind is through Théard de Chardin, very much in continuity with how he sees Christian cosmology or how Théard de Chardin taught him to see Christian cosmology. A continuously emerging cosmology, not a static cosmology, but a dynamic one. A cosmology that is always continuously emerging, that is a very important aspect of Senghor's uh, 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 thinking. So this is how he organized the encounter between the traditional uh, serial cosmology that he describes when he talks about the, his, uh, uh, the kingdom of his childhood and what he came to adopt as the Theardian or Bergsonian vision of a continuously emerging cosmology. And this is also in that cosmology precisely, uh, uh, which presents itself as Senghor describes it as a, a, a ladder of forces, a web of connected forces, going from the force of forces identified with God to the pebble through now the departed ancestors, the living human beings, the animals, the vegetals, and the minerals, the, 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 the pebble. So nothing is inert in that universe of forces. Everything is living. The universe is a universe, a web of living forces striving to become more force. This is one way, very uh, uh, quick way of describing the cosmology, the traditional serial cosmology as Senghor sees it, and more generally, a certain number of uh, West African cosmologies. Now, what is the situation of the living human beings in that cosmology? They are 
at the center in a way. If we look at the ladder, the force of forces, the departed ancestors, the living human beings, then the animals, the vegetables, and the minerals, they are in a way at the center, but this centrality doesn't mean at all that they are really uh, 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 the master and possessor of nature as uh, French philosopher Descartes famously said. In other words, this is a cosmology of, uh, uh, that situates the human being at the center, but centrality of this ontological position means responsibility for the totality of the cosmology. In other words, he, the human being is inscribed in nature, in, is one living among other living, and there is a responsibility that uh, belongs to him or her, the responsibility to take care of nature by being first part of it. And this is where Senghor contrasts this with modern, so-called modern philosophy, the philosophy of René Descartes. Descartes, uh, uh, who, as I said, said in Le Discours de la Méthode, the Discourse on Method, that uh, 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 man is master and possessor of nature. This modernity, this paradigm of uh, the human being being master and possessor of nature is the turning point when modernity meant the transformation of nature into natural resources. We have turned nature into natural resources when we gave humanity that kind of responsibility of being master and possessor of nature. And our world, our planet is dying from that philosophy. So the relevance of re-exploring this traditional cosmology is precisely to bring again in the forefront a certain number of philosophies and cosmologies who are truly our salvation in this time when we have to design and reinvent new paradigms, new understanding of our own place and situation as human being in, uh, uh, in uh, 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 nature. So this is a very important aspect. And I was very interested in uh, uh, that message coming from uh, 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 Alignan's book, and in particular, uh, the way in which he corrects something that is uh, some often sometimes said uh, uh, about the fact that uh, the human being being master and possessor of nature is also something that you find in the Abrahamic uh, message that uh, uh, everything was created for the, for the human being and, uh, and we pretend to see some continuity between this uh, message, this Abrahamic message and uh, uh, Cartesian uh, uh, epistemology and philosophy. And I was interested in uh, seeing Aliou Nyan in particular quote Genesis 2.15 which says something totally in continuity with what I have said about the uh, situation of a human being within uh, uh, this cosmology of emergence. And I went to read it uh, uh, following Alignan, when he said that the Lord took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to work it and take care of it. The responsibility of caring is very important. And I would like here, the reason why I was, I was saying Abrahamic is that what I had in mind is precisely here, the connection, the easy connection to be made with the Quran, yeah. with the Muslim faith, yeah. and the notion of the caliph of God upon earth. There is a, the, 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 the idea central to uh, uh, the Quranic cosmology is that when uh, God created the universe, and ended with the last born of creation that is the human being, the human being was created as Khalif of God, the Caliph of God upon earth. And by the way, the only meaning of Caliph in the Quran is that one, 
this idea of being the vice gerent or the lieutenant of God upon earth. Afterwards, when caliph uh, had a political meaning, this is totally uh, 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 outside of the Quranic meaning of caliph. This is a parenthesis that needed to be, to be, to be made. And what does caliph made, uh, mean? I use the word lieutenant, which is a French word. The etymology is French. Lieutenant, if you look at it, uh, the, that's the way it is written shows that it is French. It is written lieu tenant. Literally, the one who holds a place, the stead. So uh, 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 the human being is to earth what God is to the totality of his creation. So this idea that the responsibility uh, of the human being comes with his, his being the caliph of God upon earth, he is very much uh, uh, echoing what uh, uh, Aliu uh, quoted in uh, Genesis 2, uh, uh, 15. And I will end very quickly uh, within that cosmology on the significance of rain. I have loved the pages that uh, uh, Alunyan has uh, uh, devoted to rain, and in particular, this prayer by Alin Sitoe Jata, whom he uh, uh, presented us uh, uh, in his conclusion, he puts her prayer as an epigraph to his conclusion. And I would like to read that prayer by Alin Sitoe Jata. By the power of the creator God, I ask you to please grant me the water of rain. Like all the villages, I raise my hand to ask you for rain. We greet you with our devotion grant us our request. So this idea of the rain and the significance, the symbolism of rain is very important when we talk about these traditional African cosmologies. And in many, almost all human uh, uh, cultures, you find this understanding of rain as a way of revitalizing earth. The Rain falling is almost a renaissance, as we might call it, a new birth, a rebirth of, uh, of the world. It is another creation. Rain, in that sense, is a symbol for creation itself. And I would like here to, again, make the connection with uh, uh, Quranic cosmology, where, and just quote, you have many Quranic verses about the significance of rain. I want just to quote one, uh, chapter 30, uh, verse 24, when it says that God, uh, rain is among the signs of God and that he sends down rain from the sky and with it gives life to the earth after its death. This idea of giving life through rain, rain being life, but also in the same semantic field, as life being mercy. The fact that God, the rain symbolizes God's life and God's mercy is something central to the African cosmologies that uh, uh, Alunyan has described, is central to the cosmology of the uh, uh, kingdom of childhood as described by Senghor. And it is indeed central to the human experience of what it means to be resurrected after death. As earth is resurrected after death, life is always triumphant upon death. And as uh, 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 the, the Bible says, only the dead will be burying the dead. When death comes, it only takes what looks like it, that is what is dead, and against life, death can nothing. And I was very happy to read that kind of message in uh, Alunyan's book, Thank you very much for having me in this conversation and thank you for sending me your book and I will have my copy signed inshallah uh, uh, soon. Thank you. Reverend Thomas. Yes, yes. So I just wanted to say thank you so much for having me. I wanted to just give some brief reflections on um, 
on this book, which speaks so much to my experience in class with Professor Niang at Union Theological Seminary, um, meeting him through a class from the Center of Earth Ethics, which was my first year at Union. It was the best. And, um, and going to Senegal, uh, when Professor Niang came to that class uh, visiting to introduce the Jala people and talk about that, I thought, of chance of going to Africa, this is this is exactly it. Answered a prayer for me, and so I was grateful to be able to participate. Um, going to um, taking another course um, in um, West African Biblical Study, and also to actually go to Senegal with Dr. Nia. Um, I think we have a slide, um, Andrew. And um, the first slide really shows um, the, so we had a chance while in Senegal to visit the museum there. And as we first walked in, there was this large wooden drum in the center of the hall. And Dr. Niang explained that this is the drum that was in the center of community and called all the community members together. And it speaks to me now as I have listened to your presentation and um, the previous presentation really, how community is not only the community of the people coming together, that is only one small aspect. It is the community of also the ancestors that are called together, speaking directly to Ama and Allah Emmett, speaking directly to all of the created world, speaking to the animals, speaking to the uh, flora and fauna, speaking to the, the sea life and the insects. Every single thing that is created is part of Jala community. And what really speaks to my heart as I think about this, and as I have been working with indigenous communities here in this hemisphere, specifically with the Ramapo community, is that the universality of this understanding of community. Community is for indigenous people, all that is, all that has been created by a creator. It is not only us, the two-legged, it is the four-legged, it is the winged, it is the green people, it is the earth, mother, father, it is everything that is, that is made, um, which is a struggle for us raised in a Western colonized society to think about and to reach, reach into and understand. But as we have these climate experiences, we come to think more deeply about what is happening to the world around us and that we need to very much get in touch with our broader community that sustains us. We in fact are the most vulnerable of all of community. Yes, we have reason and logic, we have language, but again, <laughs> we are dependent on every other aspect of the created world that is that exists. Um, so, I want to really um, go now to um, our next slide. And the first one you see there is really, I call her Senegal Saint. Uh, on that boat is the name of Alien Sitoe Jata. And um, we were on our way to Gore Island when we saw this boat with her name on it. Her name is really everywhere because they want to carry her spirit everywhere um, and what she meant to the people because she stood up against the colonizing forces. Um, a strong young woman who believed in her mission, in her vocation to, um, um, to bring the rain to the people so that the people could eat. And I think what, what really strikes me is she understood and interrupted what the colonizing agents wanted to do. They wanted to have the Sabbath take place on Sunday, as was the French colonizing um, structure. 
their belief system, but Ali and Sitoa Jijata understood and the people understood that Sabbath needed to take place on Saturday, that rest was critical in order for their, their farming to be successful. When they followed her directives, when they followed her advice, her counsel, their farming was successful. And so more and more came to her, which was why she was such a threat to the colonizers. And so then, of course, they took her away and, um, and she died of, of starvation. But um, her spirit still lives on, I believe. And I think her spirit helped to push forward the negritude that, um, that really enlivened people to begin to think we will shed the skin of colonization. We will shed the ideas of colonization and we will own who we originally and always have been because that's what always has to happen. We will go back to our origins. We will not lose who we are. Um, now, this next slide here uh, with the Colossus statue, which has a fabulous museum inside, I will have to tell you. Um, but climbing into that statue, it, it's, it's wonderful. Uh, this is a family unit here. The woman is pointing to the past and we see she is standing with, um, with her spouse and the child is pointing towards the future. And so with this beautiful statue, Senegal is moving forward. Um, I believe um, with an, an understanding of what negritude really, really brings them. Uh, this was our visit to the Salt Lake and there were so many people at the Salt Lake. This was a community um, taking the salt from the lake and putting it in piles and packaging it and selling it, um, the salt for healing purposes and this beautiful young woman who wanted her photo taken. Um, I wanted to share briefly um, an awareness that I came to as we were in this community where so many people were working so hard. There was a man who was standing behind us. And when I turned and looked, I noticed that this man was changing his clothes. And as an American born in Brooklyn, this was something that doesn't happen. People don't change their clothes in public. And so I was aghast. Well, and no one else was because they gave him the grace to be in community, to understand that he needed his privacy and to avert their eyes. No one gawked, no one pointed, no one gasped. And so I then realized my American self needing to turn away and allow him his dignity. But this community who loved him, whether they knew him or not, provided that for him. And it just gave me a real sense and understanding of how deeply that community is felt in, in providing dignity for the next person, that love and that grace. And it, it was an awa awakening for me. Thank you, next slide. This was at Gore Island. This was the castle where the colonists lived above the colonizers, those who were having the people herded into the dungeons below. And the women were separated in one camp and the men separated on another side. And those governors would come down the stairs and they would be able to have their choice of who, which woman they would take upstairs in order to abuse them, which woman or which girl. Um, one of the men who was giving us the tour had said that, well, the women liked to be able to, you know, stay and um, sort of, if they had a choice as to go on the boats or to stay, you know, and I reminded him that these ancestors didn't like any of this. This was not a liking situation. These were people enslaved and they knew that their husbands and their brothers and their fathers could not rescue them. And they knew that they were in peril and they, um, you know, as hard as they prayed, this was the difficulty that they lived with. And so whatever they made, choice they made was for survival's sake. This next 
picture here is the picture of the door of no return. And it just reminds me of all of our ancestors who have been in that doorway leading to the ships, however they construed the plank for them to get on board um, forcibly, of course, and to pray for the memories of our ancestors and what they have suffered. What we suffer today is not even close, but we will always hold them and, um, and bless them for understanding what it was that they have lived through and that we will always work to hold an understanding of their traditions and their culture and their love of all of creation and their love of Allah Emmet and, um, and to be in service to each other and to recreate the communities that they had, um, that they believed in, that they lived um, in. Thank you, next slide. This is the site that I thought I would never see, the beautiful beach um, on the coast of Senegal. And I'm looking at how pristine it is, the sand and the water it looks like sea glass green. This is the coast of Africa. And, um, and I hope to return um, when Professor Niang has another trip to Senegal. Um, to see that beach and to and to visit that beach again. Next slide, please. And these are just some youth. Um, not sure where they were going, but they looked very happy to have their picture taken. And I was happy to take it um, as they were just, um, maybe they were working or whatever, not sure, but um, beautiful children. Thank you. Next slide. And this is a pilgrimage to see uh, the Black Madonna at a shrine. Um, hundreds of people would walk to this shrine to see this shrine. And um, we were blessed to be able to visit with this shrine also um, in, in Senegal. Next, yes. And this is the cathedral in uh, the main city in Dakar. Uh, that's the outside of the of the cathedral, and this is the ceiling of the cathedral. And it was wonderful to see all of the beautiful paintings uh, inside, all of the images, um, and to see representation, you know, of African people in all of these um, the beautiful artwork within the cathedral. And I also wanted to note that the organ that was donated to the cathedral was donated by the local imam. So that means that um, as one faith is building a cathedral and honoring their own uh, religious tradition, that another religious tradition is supporting them. And that understanding of um, the social contract that we understand and respect each other, they're not warring over religion. They're supporting each other because they are all one people. They are all African people. They're all Senegalese people. And that, that's a beautiful thing. Next slide, please. And this is a mission, a country a mission chapel. Also, you see this beautiful representation uh, in the artwork. Um, the Stations of the Cross represented there and the wall and in the ceiling. Thank you, next slide. In this first slide you see, we had come to um, a mosque and they were telling us stories and telling us their history. And I see uh, in the background, a beautiful woman was there. And as she saw that I had lifted my phone to take her picture, she hid her face. Um, she was beautiful. Um, and and they sang to us so beautifully that we did not want to leave. Um, and in the next picture, there is an African traditional healer. And uh, we had ceremony with her. We did not take photos in that particular setting, but we took photos outside um, um, after our, our visit with her. Um, and she blessed all of us. She also mentioned that she also practices Islam. And so 
you know, we see that people um, express themselves as they are best suited to do um, in, re in accepting and respecting their different religious um, beliefs. Next slide, please. Is that it? That's it. Um, yeah. I wanted to just mention a couple of other things which, you know, in relation to the conversation on ne neg negritude. Um, and, you know, as a person of African American descent and also a person of Cherokee ancestry and um, Carib Indian ancestry, I think I see so many alliances between the conversation on negritude and the conversations in Black and African American communities in how we choose to define ourselves on the other side of colonization. Um, for us, colonization has just taken different forms from enslavement to Jim Crow to mass incarceration. It hasn't ended, it just continues in new forms. And those who colonize with their appetite for subjugation, their appetite for bullying and controlling, the domination effect, if you will, that is um, what we continue to work against as we try to decolonize. And, uh, but with an understanding of what negritude is bringing to the people in, um, in Senegal for people to really define themselves. The success of colonization is that, um, and you mentioned this, you know, and I, I have to speak on this, that it was not only to own one's body, but to own one's mind and to de destroy their religious connection to their culture and also their language, um, to have one disparage themselves in order to be able to take on the colonizing agent. And the struggle is always to push past that, to reposition oneself and to go forward with an understanding that we will name ourselves, we will define ourselves and we will take our traditions and culture and live into them once again. The rains will wash the earth anew and hopefully wash our mindsets anew outside of colonization. So thank you so much for having me. Thank you so much, Reverend Tomes. This has just been a wonderful, uh, rich discussion and uh, we do need to wrap up, but I wanted to have uh, one last opportunity for um, to hear from Professor Nyang uh, uh, in, in response to what's been said, and then perhaps you could close us out. Thank you so much, uh, uh, Dr. <clears throat> Jiang and uh, Raivan Petratham. Thank you all for uh, responding to what I just presented. And <clears throat> I would we'll add one thing, and that is what the Jola people did, even though there were some Jola people who indeed collaborated with empire, uh, the Jola tradition still remains. Most of the Jola people will uh, travel from Dakar, eh, whenever the rainy season begins, they go back for uh, farming rice. So, the culture still tries to negotiate with empire as we speak. Now, um, the thing that I will say in closing is this, um, the connection between the Quran and how uh, Dr. Jain connects it with this idea that the rain, rain re offers something crucial that we don't think about. In traditional cultures, yes, rain is so powerful. Rain is almost looked at as something that is a divine gift. And the gift of our agriculture is also a gift. If Israel is a tenant and the land belongs to God and that Israel will adhere. If Israel adheres to the divine command you have this symbiotic relationship 
in a symbiotic relationship that God will always uh, provide the land. Speak is almost like Genesis chapter one, where God spoke into creation and then vegetation responds to, responds to God's speech, um, land responds to God's speech, waters responded to God's speech. So which means um, all these aspects of nature that are responding to God have a sacred, a sacred dimension to all of them. This rain is sacred for a jola. The food we eat is sacred because that's what God provided for us for sustenance and that there will be enough to go around if only we trust our relationship with nature, a relationship that is healthy, instead of one where nature becomes an object of exploitation. Thank you. Thank you so much to all of you. Um, really deeply appreciate uh, your time and we're honored uh, to have convened this with the Institute for African Studies and uh, send you off with uh, much gratitude, many blessings for the rest of your day. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you all.